Okay, camera on me before he starts singing Hamilton again. I really can't afford to pay royalties. In the aftermath of the events at Lexington and Concord, about 6,000 British soldiers occupied the city of Boston, while about 15,000 Americans under General Artemis Ward lay in siege around it. The British Navy controlled the sea, however, and by it sent three generals to the aid of General Thomas Gage. Their names would soon fill the pages of countless history books. Together with Gage, William Howe, John Burgoyne, and Henry Clinton devised a plan to seize the strategically important Dorchester Heights to the south. On June 17th, the British won their first victory of the war, not in seizing Dorchester Heights, but rather in forcing the Americans off the Charlestown Peninsula and back into Cambridge. Aye. Fear not, the jackalope, for it was hardly a victory worth singing about. General Clinton, in fact, would write in his diary that a few more such victories would have surely put an end to British dominion in America. Huh? Confused? Stay tuned, we've got the Battle of Bunker Hill on this episode of Bigfoot's Great American History Show. The day before the battle, the Americans had acquired intelligence regarding the British plans to break out of Boston. General Ward pressed to action by, among others, Brigadier General Israel Putnam, or Old Putt as he was known, agreed to fortify Bunker Hill on the Charlestown Peninsula in preparation for a British attack. Accordingly, shortly after nine on the night of the 16th, Colonel William Prescott led about a thousand men onto the peninsula where they dug in on Breed's Hill. Huh? But don't I mean Bunker Hill? No indeed. Why the change in plans? Likely because it was closer to Boston, but no one knows for sure. In any case, the redoubt was built there. By dawn, the men had dug a square fortification, about 130 feet long on all sides, consisting of deep trenches and earthen walls about six feet high. Naturally, the rising sun revealed the new American landscaping, and at first light on the 17th, the British warship, the HMS Lively, opened fire on the redoubt. Shortly, General Gage and British Admiral Samuel Graves ordered all guns in the harbor, as well as those from the batteries in Boston, to open fire on the hill. Here, one American soldier died, and the entire supply of water for the troops was destroyed. Yet even under fire, Prescott ordered his men to continue work on the fortifications, which included the construction of a breastwork the length of an entire football field on the eastern side of the hill. This would provide some protection to his left flank, with his right protected by Charlestown itself. Meanwhile, a few smaller fortifications were made by Putnam's men on Bunker Hill. Around 1 p.m., General Howe finally landed his troops, uncontested under cover of artillery fire, near Moulton's Hill, east of Breed's Hill. The new American breastwork gave him pause, and he did not attack immediately. The Americans wisely used the intervening time to further strengthen their left flank. In a pinch, Captain Thomas Knowlton and about 200 men of Putnam's regiment reinforced a rail fence north of the redoubt using stones and fresh hay. Still, a beach lay unprotected beneath them. Thankfully, an astute colonel named John Stark arrived with reinforcements sent by Ward, in time to build a short stone wall to extend the fortification to the water's edge. A good thing, too. As it happened, the British plan included an assault by a column of light infantry along the beach, coordinated with an assault in lines on the rail fence. Once through the fence, the troops would turn and attack the American position on Breed's Hill from the rear. A diversionary attack on the redoubt would keep the Americans there from coming to the aid of the men on the rail fence. The British were over 2,200 strong by the time General Howe finally led the assault on the rail fence. To his left, Brigadier General Sir Robert Pickett directed the diversionary attack on the redoubt. At this early point in the war, the British remained confident that an inexperienced American army composed of assorted ne'er-do-wells would fold quickly. Unfortunately for the British, Breed's Hill was littered with fences, wild grass, swamps, and clay pits, making it impossible for the lines to coordinate their movements properly. Low on powder, the Americans were ordered to hold their fire until the regulars were in close range, or, as Prescott allegedly put it, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. 
In the end, the British were unable to close the distance necessary to make a deadly charge with bayonets. They retreated after suffering heavy losses, then reformed and marched again. Again, the attack failed. Meanwhile, a British shell set Charlestown on fire, and the American snipers in the city were forced to abandon it. About half an hour later, reinforced by 400 additional soldiers from Boston, Howe attacked a third time. Unlike in his first attack, however, he attacked the redoubt directly, and with his main force in column, with the hope of affording them the opportunity to make a bayonet charge at close range. And this time the Americans finally exhausted their ammunition. Facing a force of more experienced fighters wielding bayonets, the militia retreated, under covering fire from Knowlton's men on the rail fence. By 5 p.m., the entire American force had fled back to Cambridge. In the end, the British lost 226 men, with another 828 wounded. By comparison, the Americans lost 140 lives, with 271 wounded. Among the casualties were Joseph Warren, the American responsible for sending Paul Revere to Lexington two months earlier, and John Pitcairn, who had led the British regulars onto Lexington Green the next morning. The British may have taken the peninsula, but the high casualty count was hardly encouraging to the folks back home. A few months after the battle, General Gage was dismissed, and General Howe given his place. Meanwhile, the Colonials had formed the Second Continental Congress after the events of Lexington and Concord. On June 16th, even as the Americans in Charlestown prepared to defend Breed's Hill, Congress appointed a popular Virginian and veteran of the French and Indian War to the position of General and Commander-in-Chief of the newly created Continental Army. Two weeks later, General George Washington arrived in Boston to take command of the siege. What happens next? Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel and hit that notification button to make sure you don't miss an episode. For now, this is Bigfoot saying so long and save me a seat at your next campfire. Thank you.